All right, a special edition of Krantz's Corner. You can see right now on the other side of this video, Ian Eagle going to join us here. He's been on the call for the Heat and Knicks uh, series so far. Now, all of a sudden, it's 3-2. The Knicks have a little bit of life down here in South Florida. We thought it was all over. And <laughs> guess what? The Knicks come back, and now they have life. And the Knicks fans are back out of hiding. They are literally back out of hiding. I and my brother is a diehard Knicks fan. He was missing from our text conversations, our text <laughs> chats for 36 hours. And all of a sudden this morning, it was that Undertaker one where the guy, he's like laying down like this and he pops up. That was what's going on. But anyways, Ian, welcome to Krantz's Corner before we do anything else. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's my honor to be in the Krantz's Corner. And I know what you're talking about. The pendulum swings in the NBA playoffs. You get a lot of recency bias, uh, very strong opinions based on the previous result and then things can shift and move the reality is still Miami has got the home court advantage right now a chance to wrap this thing up at home if you would have told any heat fan prior to this series you're going to be up three two with game six on your home floor you would have signed up for that every possible way so now the question is whether or not they can actually take care of business and advance to the Eastern Conference Finals and do it on their terms. Yeah, and, and let me tell you what needs to happen or needs not to happen for the Heat to win. Two things in my mind. A, you can't let the big three for the Knicks go for 88 points in a game. Yep. And Jimmy Butler's got to – I know he said after the game, I don't necessarily need to score for us to win. Well, guess what, Jimmy? I, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, but bubble Jimmy and the last couple of years, Jimmy in the playoffs – you needed a score for the Heat to win, and get, I need it. I need it again, Jimmy. Yeah. you got to put up 30 points. What would he end up shooting? He only had 12 shots in the game. I know he got to the free throw line 11 times. I need 20 shot attempts from Jimmy Butler, and I need the Knicks, big three, not to go for almost 100 points in the game. I think that's a pretty good game plan. Yeah, I think it's a fair assessment. Right. First on on Jimmy, yeah, there, there definitely was not the aggressiveness that we've grown accustomed to with Butler. Don't know if that's injury related. Don't know if he was feeling his way through the game. Normally, he gives the team whatever it is they require in the moment. There, there was definitely a sense in the fourth quarter where it was normally Jimmy Butler takeover time. That wasn't at play on Wednesday night. But with that said, I just feel like he always has such great command over the situations in front of him. He's certainly going to recognize what's at stake with a chance to put an end to this thing, to do it on Miami's home floor. And as you mentioned, the, the big three for New York, look, Brunson right now is on a major heater. He is putting up ridiculous numbers. He's got that presence and that leadership ability that the Knicks have been yearning, looking for, for so many years. I don't know if you can just flat out stop this guy right now. You can double him. You can pick him up right. full court. Miami's shown him so many different looks. He's still finding ways to score. Randall, as we've seen in this series, has been tentative at times. And I thought he gained some of his confidence back in, in game number five. There's no doubt about it. R.J. Barrett, to me, has flown under the radar. Yep. He's done his job. He's done it well. He's not been an issue. There were times, as we know, in the Cleveland series where he came under some fire in their losses, uh, maybe uh, he didn't do quite enough, but it hasn't been his fault by any stretch from a New York perspective. So uh, I think they're getting what they hope to be getting from R.J. Barrett in this series, and he seems to be gaining some momentum as we go here as well. It's, it's funny, too, because when I look back at the box score and we, we keep talking about 88 from the big three for the Knicks, yeah. uh, you could have told me Brunson had 50. I would have believed you without looking at the box score. But if you would have told me Julius Randle had 24, I almost wouldn't believe you. It, there were there were times during the game where I looked up or I was checking even after he hit a shot or missed a yeah. shot and they put the stats on the screen. I'm like, this guy has like seven or eight points. Like, how are, the, how are the Knicks winning this game by so much? And Julius Randle isn't contributing. Then he ends with 24. It was kind of a shocker to me. Like you said, R.J. Barrett literally – doing his thing and, and yeah. I'm not, you know, and, and, I, and I get it. He, if you can keep him under 30 points, then you have a good chance to win. Brunson is going to do his thing. I get that too. You got to, it's, it's back in the day. Let Brunson have his points, but stop everyone else. If, if you want to try to win this game, but Julius Randall to me, I think is the key to the Knicks winning and they were winning the game so big and Julius wasn't even contributing early on. I was completely shocked by all that and completely shocked at the end of the game. When I saw he had 24 points. 
Yeah, that's a key point because when Randall was in the game, he played the entire first quarter, took that poke to the eye. It right. certainly was a legitimate issue and injury for him. And it was just over a minute into the game, but he plays the entire first quarter. He knocks down his first attempt, which was a three. And then you don't really hear from him again. Right. The Knicks go on their run in the second quarter. Everything got sparked in that second quarter. Obi Toppin came in and actually gave them quality minutes and good energy. And that's when Brunson was getting his fingerprints all over the game. And I remember that Randall came in late stages, second quarter was a little bit invisible, but made a shot right, right at the end of the half. And that seemed to get him going a bit. You're right. When the Knicks made their, their two big runs went up by 19 in the third quarter, it wasn't really Randall who was no. a big part of it, but their closing lineup, he did make some big plays and there was a sense that he was getting his and his way. The fact that he was getting to the free throw line, not just settling for fadeaway 19 footers was a pretty good sign for Tom Thibodeau. I do think there are still some question marks and issues there as to his current state of mind and whether or not he's comfortable, but that was a big lift for New York. Whether or not it translates to a game six remains to be seen. I got to tell you, Zach, the two games that the Knicks played in Miami, and this is just a feeling that you get first as a viewer, because I didn't work that game, game right. three, and then as a broadcaster in game four, there was literally not one moment in either one of those two games where I thought the Knicks would win the game. Not one moment, not one second. And that shows you something about how these two teams match up. Miami, when they're doing it their way, they've been clearly the better team. It's incredible, too, because obviously you're, you're calling the Nets during the regular season. You're yep. all around the NBA during the, the regular season. And if you don't really follow the Miami Heat, you don't. Under, there, there are times when they have three or four undrafted guys out there. I know that's always yep. the storyline behind you know, it is. The, it's it always a storyline, and that's fine for us down here in South Florida. We're kind of used to it um, sure. to hear that. But it is crazy to me, even as an NBA fan, when I could see the game at the end or the end of the game, and it's possible that Max Struess and Gabe Vincent or Duncan Robinson, these guys are out there, and they're legitimate threats. Like Duncan yep. Robinson, finally, I mean, you called the Duncan game. Like he finally had a game where he was legitimately looked like Duncan Robinson from a couple of years ago. Max Struess, if you give him a foot, he's going to take the shot. And another guy, Gabe Vincent, I think he's made himself a lot of money in these playoffs so far going into a free agent year, but it's undrafted. It's, it's, it's truly, to me, unbelievable what the Heat system does. And I know I sound like a homer here from Miami and a Miami Heat No, fan, no, no, it's true. But it, it, it's, it's true. Isn't it unbelievable? Because then you look at other teams, they got four first-round draft picks out there, a guy they just gave $200 yeah. million in free agency to. And the Heat are like, yeah, we're going to put out Struess and Vincent and, and then Kevin Love, who we bought off the free agent wire yeah. uh, the, uh, during the season. But that's what this Heat team is all about. It's really gritty that way. That's why Jimmy, I think, fits in perfect with these guys, even though Jimmy's not an undrafted kind of guy like that. He just plays like that. Throw Caleb Martin into that as well. Right, Give him right. a ton of credit because I think there are times where his energy and his aggressiveness can really ignite Miami. I thought uh, when we look back at game four, he helped seal it. Uh, his track downs on offensive rebounds and then him going to the rim hard and getting the crowd involved on on that big dunk. Uh, those are memories. And you're right. I know it's a broken record in South Florida, the way Miami has done it. But I feel like I try to pick and choose my spots when telling that story on a national level. It just should not go under the radar. Right. It, it's it's real. This heat culture is real. Their ability to evaluate talent develop talent. I think a, a lot of it has to do with, of course, Pat Riley and Eric Spolstra and their bond and their lens of how they see the NBA, how they see the pieces that fit together. I give a lot of credit to Andy Ellisberg as well, who is part of that brain trust, and they look for a certain type and certain attributes that fit with what they do. And just talking to Eric Spolstra about some of these guys, and I've asked him about each of the guys that you mentioned at some point during production meetings, regular season, play in, play off, and he's always got an anecdote for all of them and what they bring and how they cater to what it is 
Miami is looking for. He said with Caleb Martin, he had heard that at some point back in his Oak Hill Academy days, they called him and his twin brother Psycho One and (laughs) Psycho Two. Like these guys were so locked in and everybody knew it. Like stay away from these two when they're out there playing. They were at NC State. They transferred to Nevada. So you got a chip on your shoulder right out of the gate that it didn't work in the one place. You got to go somewhere else. And each of them had personal accolades and they act like it. Uh, Caleb, I, I remember hearing the story when he was let go by Charlotte. Miami basically gave him a look and he came in. And after one practice, I believe, they said, we got to sign this dude. Right. Like, uh, unless our eyes are deceiving us, he does everything that we're looking for that maybe doesn't show up in a box score. And that was it. And he ends up getting a three-year, $20 million deal. You're right about Gabe Vincent. Gabe, any team in the NBA, Zach, could have had Gabe Vincent. I agree. He played right, on the Stockton right, Kings. He was available to everyone. Max Struess, every team in the league could have had Max Struess. Miami continues to find not just roles for these guys, but primetime roles. Duncan Robinson obviously cashed in big, so it's funny how it works. Robinson, underrated talent, and then when he gets paid all the money, overrated talent. Right, and right. now he's finding his role again and finding his niche based on the Tyler Hero and Victor Oladipo injury. So yeah, that's a whole other storyline that you take away two rotation players, one major rotation player, a guy that has the ball in his hands quite a bit in Tyler Hero and another in Oladipo uh, that was a very high draft pick and and has proven himself at this level. It's just been injuries that have slowed him down. So yeah. I could go on and on. I am in awe of what Miami continues to do every year. That's why they're also not the normal eight seed. I know we've right. got to rank them. That's how it works. But at some point, I'm not even using the regular season numbers other than to make a comparison, compare and contrast what we've seen in the postseason. Miami's not an eight seed. No. They just don't. No, they're not. They're not. What about Bam Adebayo? What do you think about him so far in the series? He gets criticized a lot for not taking too many, you know, not taking enough shots. Yeah. Uh, not being enough in the offense. Last year in the playoffs, too, the minute the playoffs were over, it was, where was Bam? We need more from Bam. Bam needs to be better. Yeah. He's, he's gotten his game pretty – every year it, it develops a little bit more – and that's kind of the heat culture, too, to work on something in an offseason, get good at it, next offseason work on something else, and become a complete player. I think Bam Adebayo is doing a pretty good job. I was one of the critics last year. They get knocked out in the first round. They get swept. Where the hell's Bam Adebayo? Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, he's getting back into it. And there were times in not just last game, but in the last couple of games, where if it wasn't for a big Bam play, who knows where the game would have went. So Bam has been kind of uh, one of those playmakers. Yeah, I thought he was the standout of game four. He set the tone in game four, dunk after dunk right. after dunk. Offensive rebounds, which are killers. You know, it's so demoralizing when uh, you can't come away with the basketball on a Miami miss if you're the New York Knicks. Right. And the door was still open. It was a six-point game. It was an eight-point game. One of those sequences goes the other way. Maybe you're looking at a four-point game, a three-point game and a team could get tight. It never got into that territory because of the likes of Bam Adebayo. I think a couple things in regards to Bam. One, look, we get used to certain things. Bam's a center. That's the position he plays in the NBA. So the assumption is, all right, yeah, he's, you know, 7'2", 260 pounds. He's not. No. We forget. He's 6'9". Right. Bam Adebayo is a really unique defender, switchable and can cover up so many little mistakes that the naked eye can't even pick up because of his versatility. He can make something happen defensively that other guys cannot just because he can go out and deal with a guard or force a smaller player around to take a different angle, go into the rim, and then Butler rotates over, comes up with a huge block, and everybody's talking about, oh my goodness, Jimmy Butler, incredible. You're like, no. It was Bam who funneled him that way because of his uh, agility and dexterity. So uh, I think with Bam, he sometimes gets a little bit of a raw deal on the offensive end. That word passive gets thrown around. I think he plays within himself. He's not a guy that all of a sudden is trying three-pointers or is forcing his way into the game. He really does let the game come to him. And yes, are there times where you'd like to see him be a bit more of 
a type A? Yes, but I agree with you. I think we've seen an evolution. I think we've seen steady improvement from him, and he's become a much more dependable figure in, uh, what is this, year six in the yeah, NBA? Six. Yeah, yeah. He's still 25 years old. We tend to forget that part as well. All right, 25 years old, six years in the NBA. I can't put, it's, it's, it's crazy when you even say something like that. All right, so we got a game six coming up on Friday night here in Miami. They got to close. If they go to game seven, I'm going to freak out. And the Knicks fans are going <laughs> to, I mean, I can't, I can't even, I can't even imagine. They were in hiding, like I said, for a couple of days. But boy, did they come out this morning and last night late just to make sure that everyone yeah. knew we're still here at this point. Jimmy Butler, we'll end on this and I'll let you go. Jimmy Butler, I think, is underrated in the NBA when it comes to superstar status because of the fact that he is kind of – he loves being a facilitator. That's been his thing forever. He's always mm-hmm. said that. We just talked about that before. Is he looked at in the NBA as a top 10 player, a top five – I'm not going to say five player. That's not fair. The top 10 player in the NBA in your eyes when you talk to people, or is he kind of in that next tier after that? No, I think if you did a poll of his peers – he would finish in the top 10. Yeah. Yes. I think there's a a very high respect level for what he brings to a team as a competitor, as a leader, and obviously his skills, which have become fantastic all-around skills. Is he the greatest three-point shooter ever? Of course not. He isn't. But he also picks and chooses his spots. But his feel, his IQ, his savviness, that's just innate. And it's stuff that he has really put his imprint on with every team he's played. There's there's a reason why he's been an alpha. And it didn't happen overnight for Jimmy Butler. If you think back, all you have to do is look at his numbers. You know, it it was a it was a slow boil for him in his NBA career. And he had to find his way and he had to convince decision makers that he really was that that type of guy. Philadelphia fans, if you polled them right now and said, hey, if you had a chance to, to get Jimmy Butler back, it would be nearly a 100% reaction of that was not the right decision. They basically elected to keep Ben Simmons instead of Jimmy Butler back at the time where they had to make some decisions about how they were going to spend their money. So amongst NBA people, I believe Butler gets his flowers. Fans, I that part I don't know. I, I do know. Yeah. yeah, there is there is a respect level uh, here in the New York area. You could feel it. Uh, he didn't play in in game two. We know what he did in game one. He plays last game, and as we pointed out, there were moments where maybe he didn't quite look like himself. I sensed anxiousness at MSG at the start of the game to compare the vibe inside Madison Square Garden game two. To game five, it was no comparison. Game two, you could feel it. You could still feel the energy. Even after the game one loss, uh, there was still a very strong belief in this team and what they could do in the series. There was a different feeling inside MSG to start that game. And it wasn't until the second quarter that you could feel the juice and the ambiance. And... uh, there's a tentativeness, you know, right. Knicks fans, obviously uh, this was a season where they overachieved, but Zach, you know, this, once you're in it, expectations all change, matters. right? Make the tournament. That's it. Just make, the that's tournament. it. Right. So now, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of that, that rebirth for Nick fans that maybe they can believe again, but boy, they, they're going to have to overcome a very difficult challenge of winning down in Miami, which uh, has not been easy. And in this series, as mentioned, it's, it's really felt like heat controlled right. within the confines of their home arena. That's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. They want to keep that home court. They want to make sure when you come down here, it's tough to win. Uh, Ian, I can't thank you enough for coming on Francis corner. Uh, by the way, Francis Corner sitting in the middle of the mecca of sports in the last month and a half between the NCAA tournament, women's and men's, Division right. Two, Nova Southeastern Division Two champs, the Panthers, the Heat. I mean, we're having a pretty good time down here in South Florida in sports. Formula One. Uh, I, I caught the back end of that right, when I right. checked into my hotel on, 
on Sunday night, and there was some remnants of uh, the F1 and the, the race car fans. So a Miami Open, there's a lot going on in South Florida. Right now, it's a pretty good time to be a sports fan in, in your neck of the woods. Not bad. Until football season starts, and then we get disappointed at some point. During the no, season. don't say that. Just joking, because we're on fire. We're on fire. We're going to keep <laughs> it going. Ian, thank you so much for your time today in Krantz's Corner. Uh, we had your partner from Football, Charles Davis, on a while back. I threw out the idea of having you and Charles on at the same time, and he freaked out. He was happy. So guess what? We're going to try to do that before football season starts. Nice. A little NFL football at this point. But honestly, I've known you for a long time. I, I thank you so much every time you come on with us. If people only knew the text messages I send you, they would think I'm absolutely crazy. And probably you for the responding. So there you go. At that point, we're both going to take some of that as it is. But honestly, I thank you all through all these years for always helping, and I am going to bug you again. My pleasure, Zach. Great to be on with you. My first appearance on Krantz's Corner. How and about that? It's, it's memorable. Listen, I'm a part budget, of it now. I'm a budget, part of history. The budget for my little Sesame Street thing here, come on. It's perfect, right? It's perfect. Pretty good. We don't have a big budget. Uh, that's I don't. I only get a nice shirt and this, and that's it. Everything else. Yeah, is. really. Uh, the way it works out with with your setup, you, your show is actually Crant Orner. Right. I don't even know which way to move so you can see it all. I, I, I don't know. Crant Orner. Yeah. 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 Which also works. You know what? I'm gonna have to duck so you can see it all right there. Okay. Oh but, no, I don't want to duck. You see my hair? Oh god, that's terrible. I thank you again. We'll bug you again soon. Have a great call coming up. On the call for Heaton and Knicks, I mean, this has been a hell of a series, and now all of a sudden we're going to game six coming up. That's Ian Eagle. This has been a special edition of Crancis Corner.